The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. He came to seek, he came to save, endured the cross, rose from the grave, and we will be forever in his arms. Our hope is firm. Debt is paid, our sin on him by God is laid, and we will be forever in his arms. We are dead to sin and alive in Christ. We are dead to sin. Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Forever in Glory by Richard Jensen from his album Worship. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on or about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. We're going to kick off this pilot program with one of the most admittedly difficult theological problems uh, in discussion today which is the problem of evil. Now as we jump with both feet forward into discussing this problem we want to first of all acknowledge that there is no way that any of us using our human uh, reason, intellect, or knowledge is going to be able to understand this problem. The only way that we're going to hope to discuss and understand this problem is using the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 clearly tells us, quote, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Unquote. This verse basically tells us that we start from a flawed nature due to sin, and trying to proceed from that foundation and understand things which are supernatural and which are of God's nature is going to be a fruitless endeavor unless we first ask God for His Spirit by which we can then by His grace understand His nature as well as our relationship to Him. That being the case I think it behooves us to open this discussion with a word of prayer. Father, we earnestly come to before you this day and we ask you, Lord, to open our minds and to open our hearts and to pour out your Spirit upon us and give us spiritual discernment to help us remove those things within us which preclude us from understanding those things about your nature which you want us to understand. Lord, we just pray that you will give life to our spirit, to our hearts, and to our minds, so that we might understand your nature, and that we might understand our relationship to you, and that we might have all these things and know all these things by and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Now, the first question that uh, we want to ask is, why does God permit evil? This is the classic question which many people have pondered throughout the ages, and within that question is couched the classic hidden assumption behind the question that there is no God. Because if there were man reasons, why would he sit around and do nothing while it is obvious that evil things happen every day? And since evil exists in the humanist universe, God cannot. So, when man asks the why questions regarding evil, 
he is typically asking one of many predictable and situational questions, all of which are premised on the flawed logic of human reason. Typically when we ask why is there or why does God allow fill in the blank, death, disease, war, hunger, hate, anger, inequity, prejudice, you name it, evil at al, inevitably uh, mankind has pondered these questions for centuries using purely human reason, logic, and philosophy. Uh, any meaningful answer falls tragically short if man attempts to understand them from his humanistic perspectives. At the outset, we find we have a dichotomy of how we approach and understand evil. Firstly, we can attempt to understand evil according to secular humanist philosophy. Accordingly, uh, we would be able to adopt a sliding scale which identifies, which defines, and judges evil based upon personal opinion, consensus, culture, and other environmental factors. Secondly, uh, we uh, identify, accept, and define a universal absolute which serves as a reference point for both good and evil. Uh, the first issue is one of definitions. Uh, a. How do we define evil? What is it? How do we identify it? Uh, if we use loose and sloppy terminology, we could define evil as any number of things that happens to us personally, as a corporation, as a nation, as a uh, mankind, you name it. Evil can be anything from, I lost a, a dollar out of my pocket, to I lost a loved one, to uh, cancer or to some other disease. Uh, it's also a question number two of perspective. What I think might be evil might be perfectly normal to someone else or vice versa. Uh, so evil isn't necessarily always something that's agreed on from person to person. Uh, granted there are some things that uh, percentage wise we could all agree upon which are evil it does not mean that there is going to be uh, a 100 percent agreement. Uh, lastly, these loose and sloppy terminologies, the questions of perspective, ultimately lead to the third issue, which is a devaluation of and a desensitization, desensitization to the reality of e evil and its effects. Uh, by starting to say that evil is you know, I lost a dollar out of my pocket, then pretty soon evil loses its, uh, its impact. And we don't clearly understand and reserve the word evil for uh, where it is meant to be used. The second issue concerns the issue of authority. Uh, namely, whose definition holds ultimate authority? Are we going to believe that it's your definition my definition, the neighbor's definition, the government's definition, the court's definition, or God's definition. Uh, do we do it based on a consensus, a percentage, or is there some ultimate authority that we're going to look to? So this leads us to uh, two things. Number one, without absolutes, there is only relativity and consensus, both of which are fluid. Number two, without an absolute reference point, no one can identify what good or evil is. So it tells us that in order to have evil, we need to have some ultimate authority which defines what that evil is and what is good. Now thankfully, we are ultimately find that it is when we place proper context of God's word, the Bible, and what is revealed of God's nature and his relationship to man, the problem of evil is resolved. This brings us to a second and related question. Where did evil originate? In order to properly understand question one, why does God permit evil? We need to ask an accompanying question, which is related, namely, where did evil originate? So in order to answer these questions, we need to recognize that the two questions are unavoidably intertwined. Constructively speaking, if we assume 
the premise that God is omnipotent, that means that he is all-powerful, and he is omniscient, that means he is all-knowing, then we must assume that if he had chosen, he could have created in such a way as to only have beings, his creation, who were at all times perfect in all ways. In this scenario, all people would be perfectly trusting, perfectly knowing, and perfectly obeying, and perfectly loving God at all times. There would be nothing which was evil, bad, negative, or imperfect. If that were the case, the question at hand in that scenario would be, what aspect of God's creation would then demonstrate his mercy, his praise, his trust, his confidence, and his thankfulness to him? While it is possible that God could manufacture these concepts into the hearts and minds of his creation, the question then would next arise as to whether any of these attributes were truly meaningful given the fact that they are artificially manufactured as opposed to being earned or learned by experience. Scripture reveals that Genesis chapter 3 as the starting point for the introduction of both good and evil. Scripture tells us that up until chapter 3 of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, that all that existed was, quote, very good, unquote. Looking at the situation that existed, concluding with chapter 2 of Genesis, it would have been impossible to comprehend asking the question, quote, why is there evil, death, disease, hunger, war, etc., unquote. Conversely, all that could be perceived at that point was good. Thus we learn that God is neither creating nor causing the evil. Evil entered the world as the price of of the misuse of Adam and Eve's free will as the result of their decision to sin, to break fellowship with God. Evil, therefore, is the logical result, uh, i.e. the fallout, if you will, from sin. Adam and Eve's sin is like poison poured out into the headwaters of man's nature and spirit. The water which was created to be pure and life-sustaining life became forever poison to all mankind. We find ultimately that Jesus Christ is the only living water source which mankind may drink by faith and by his grace be forever healed and eternally sustained. Now, since God did not create evil, it follows that the explanation for evil is to understand that evil is within God's permissive will. God cannot, or perhaps chooses not to create anything or anyone equal to, in every capacity to his own nature, his essence and being. Whatever God creates is by necessity inferior to, in some degree, himself. God can create and call whatever he creates perfect, and at the same time, that which he creates as perfect is less than himself and is consequently mutable. That is, it's changeable, whereas God, on the other hand, is immutable. He does not change. Because man is mutable, i.e. changeable, man can and did choose to forsake grace held by faith for knowledge of good and evil, and thereby enter into sin. Both good and evil came packaged together equally with the knowledge of the two. While God does not create or author evil for anyone, his permissive will allows for events in the stream of personal and human history which play themselves out in divergent ways depending on where each individual is in their personal history from the present until eternity. The perspective and reasoning for the presence and purpose of good or evil will likewise take meaning depending on the human individual's status accordingly. The conclusion is that since all that God created was, quote, very good, we know by that revelation that God did not create evil. Instead, God's creation held the potential for both good and evil as the logical necessity required for the free will of Adam and Eve. Had they both maintained grace by faith in God, all would have remained very good and there would have been no evil. Adam and Eve's choice to exercise faith in the knowledge of good and evil 
over faith in God's grace open the door to the power of sin, to death, to sorrow, and evil in general. Evil exists then by the result of man, not God, while sin, death, sorrow, and evil in general have power over all mankind, God is still sovereign and in control over everything, including evil. Now, man's inference and insinuation, if not his outright accusation, is that God's actions, or lack thereof, are responsible in part, if not in whole, for the evil on earth that we see. The, in contrast, the revelation of Scripture is that the history of man's actions, or lack thereof, towards God and towards his fellow man are the greatest evil imaginable. Uh, on a higher level, yet rightly understood, the greatest evil possible is that the creation, man, would reject the Creator, God, and would rebel against his sovereign grace and love as extended towards fallen man by man's only redeemer Jesus Christ so the greatest evil imaginable is that we see before us our Savior our Lord Jesus Christ who created all things and we deny him therein lies the greatest evil in summary to date the first question that we asked was why does God permit evil and the answer one because if he did not none of us would exist think about it two if we did exist none of us would enter his presence in heaven three God permitted free will for Adam and Eve they chose rather the knowledge of good and evil in order to have the knowledge of both in its fullness both must be experienced thus we have contrast we cannot appreciate for example darkness without light bitterness without sweet quiet without noise good cannot be appreciated in its fullest without the presence of evil as a sub question to question one we have a companion question which is closely related namely why doesn't God do something about evil the related question presupposes that God has done nothing or is doing nothing the belief that God has not or is not also assumes man can speak with certitude about eternity from the perspective of his limited and finite perspective. Man has partial information. God has all knowledge. So in answering the sub-question, why doesn't God do something about evil? One, he did. He sent his son, Jesus, to save his people. Two, God is doing something. God is moving presently, right now, to accomplish purposes and plans which in the scheme of events are larger and infinitely more important than the temporal events we characterize as quote-unquote evil. Three, God will ultimately put all evil and all of its attributes into hell at judgment. He doesn't do so now because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Question two, we asked, where did evil originate? One, it originated as a permissible possibility contingent on Adam and Eve's free will choice to remain covered with God's grace by faith as his image bearers, or to embark in being covered by their own efforts. The first option held the continued state of perf perfect fellowship with God. The second held the consequence by choice of separation, sin, death, and evil. Two, God's perfect will was and is for good. Man chose to know both good and evil. In order to know evil, it must be experienced. This will conclude part one of the problem of evil. Please join us for part two.